Hello and good afternoon, good morning, or in some cases, good evening. We're just seeing the first 25 people sign in, so we're slowly seeing the, um, or quickly seeing the room fill up. So if you haven't, you have about one minute to grab your coffee. Or seeing how it's summer, a glass of wine maybe. So hello and welcome everyone and, and welcome to this webinar on building better innovation clusters and we're going to be talking about a lot of different things but we are going to start out with a question about you and we right now have a poll running so we see the first 10 people have have answered so we have three questions we'd like you to um we'd like you to cover and we're really curious to figure out who is actually joining this call because that's going to be important for some of the questions we're going to be asking later so if you have answered the poll already, wonderful. If not, now is a good chance to grab your coffee and answer the poll. So right now we have the first 20 people have completed the poll. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to actually do this. this. This really helps our conversation as we proceed. Now, while we're, while we're also completing the poll, I, um, I really welcome any, any questions or any comments. Um, so if you have any questions, you can, you can ask them as we go, uh, and then we might pick them up right there and then. Uh, or we're also going to have time for questions and Q&As towards the, towards the end. But there's no need to sort of save up your questions for, for all the way at the end. Okay, so we are now at almost 80% of you have completed the poll. So we're going to do about one more minute of the poll. So if you, if you just joined us and if you haven't had a look, Please um, see if you want to if you want to complete that cluster leadership poll that we have running right now. Now, one one of the things that I'm noticing in the poll, and you may be able to see the the same thing, is that. Almost 50% um, have answers on question number two. In my view, clusters are changing significantly. And you know, that's, that's really our key finding as well. There's a paradigm shift, if you will, going through the cluster, the global cluster landscape. And that's something we're gonna be talking about. Um, and then in terms of the biggest challenge, and here, of course, we have multiple choice, so you can, you can answer as, as many as you'd like. Um, Understanding landscape, cluster strategy, recruiting members, understanding members. So here we see a much more distribution, um, but clearly the, the winner, if you will, on question number three is creating value and business impact. And again, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't agree more. But I'm, I'm fascinated by the, the range and the diversity of answers on, on question number three there. And that really fits again with, with our work because what we're seeing is that there's a, well, one thing that we do say is being a cluster leader, being a cluster manager is not an easy job. And it's not like regular ordinary leadership. It is much more complex, it's much more relational and it's much more, um, I'm gonna say demanding in terms of the, um, how you execute your leadership uh, in practice. 
So we're going to wrap up the, um, the poll. We have 81% completed. It's great. And for those of you that are just joining, um, if you haven't had time, you want to look at the poll and see if you can complete that. We're going to sort of wrap that up in about 20 seconds. Now, if I want to close out on, on the poll, I'm just going to look at question number two. And in my view, clusters are changing significantly and quite a bit. So there's, there's obviously a very, very strong change dimension to the, the cluster landscape. And I think that this input is, is really interesting. And again, it just, just really resonates with what we have been finding and what we have been working on. So I'm going to wrap up the poll right here. <clears throat> And we can see the question number three, creating value and business impact. And that's something, of course, we're going to be, be talking about um, in, in the program today. All right, so let's, uh, let's jump into it and let's get started. So we have, it's, it's really my pleasure to welcome you. Uh, we have been working on effectively this content and the background and the insights for um, about three years. And it's really for the last 12 months that we've really put the, the infamous pedal to the metal and, and said, you know, let's, let's get this program up and running. And <clears throat> the starting point of what I want to share with you today is, of course, the launch of the Global Cluster Leadership Program. And this is a program that we have been slowly building up, but after COVID-19 hit, we decided to sort of just get this done and get it up and running. Uh, we have been working extensively with cluster leadership programs in, um, in Asia, in, in Europe, the Nordics, um, most recently in Mexico. But of course, no longer getting it, being able to get on a plane, it changes and it politely forces us, pleasantly forces us to get this program up and running. So the, the, the purpose of the program is, is, is really to take the global, global outlook. We are um, researching and we are interviewing cluster leaders uh, from, uh, from Spain, the Netherlands, Canada, France, Norway, Denmark. And one thing that we don't have actually is we don't have any cluster managers giving us the, the Latin American or South American perspective or the Far East Asian perspective. So we're hoping to sort of pick those up uh, in our next iteration. But right now we have 37 countries as of yesterday joining us for the launch. And that's, that's, that's really, really cool. And maybe my personal favorite is we have somebody joining us from Barbados, somebody else joining us from Mauritius. And these countries typically don't have a strong cluster framework in place. So if this program can help these countries, that would be, be superb. Now the, uh, the main purpose of the program is really to grow your cluster leadership skills we introduce 15 new strategy tools specifically developed for clusters. And then of course, there is the opportunity to work on your own cluster strategy project, ideally with your team, or if you so prefer, independently. And I'm, I'm running the program, um, but what I'm trying to do is sort of tap into my background. And when I look back over the last five years, I've worked with more than 40 different clusters and cluster initiatives uh, all around the world. And as I was sort of going through the list, um, I kind of realized that through a number of connections and introductions and coincidences, I have been invited into and been able to work with very different types of clusters, clean energy clusters, ocean space clusters, e-learning clusters, automotive clusters, wood clusters and smart city clusters, and much, much, much more. And of course, there are significant differences, significant differences based on the, on the topic, based on the um, national program, the regional program, uh, the cluster size. For example, uh, we have Cap Digital in, in Paris. They have more than a thousand members. They have 40 employees. They have been around for about 15 years. They are listed as what we call the, the, the pole position for national competitiveness in France. Uh, and then at the far end, we have some of these very, very early emerging clusters that typically don't even have a full-time employee. So we're seeing huge differences, but we're trying to extract best practices. We're trying to extract structures and we're trying in the program to really build frameworks for how you may want to, to go about the cluster strategy, both at the national and, and the local level. 
So let me give you a quick um, introduction to the high level concept behind the program. So our, our view has built what are the big questions we need to ask. And then as we ask those questions, we invite you to actually get started on those questions in your project work in the program. So for example, how can we build high growth, high value industries? Now for most clusters, this is nothing new, but for some clusters, they are probably not working on the right, I call it growth potential for their various industries. So one of the questions that we encourage clusters to work on is how can we build high growth, high value industries, but also how can we understand what we call the value impact? And of course, in the program we have, we have tools and we have processes and we have templates for how we can actually do that in, in practice. Second, we also ask questions on, on national transformation. So how can we accelerate national transformation? And one of the cases that we have in the program is, is from Malaysia and how the Malaysian government launched their TN50 or Transformation National 2050 program. And basically the Malaysian cluster initiative became a implementation framework, a strategy framework for realizing the TN50. Just as an example, we're seeing now countries in the Middle East uh, that have pretty strong economic diversification ambition, but then they're looking at clusters as the strategy implementation framework again at the national level. Equally, we look at how can clusters contribute to GDP and value output. And of course, this will require clusters to really work on high value, high impact industries. And we have, uh, we've seen a lot of medium practices in terms of understanding how is our cluster positively moving towards the GDP impact, um, where some clusters would just say, you know, that doesn't make sense to us, it's not relevant to us. While many clusters, many clusters would say, of course, that is, that is why we exist. We exist to, to develop the GDP per capita. Uh, why else would we be doing this? So some of these questions and many more questions like them are introduced early in the program for your discussion and reflection and hopefully to fuel your project work. I think it's important to take a step back and I realized we, we do have some people with us right now in this webinar that are quite new to clusters or don't have access to cluster. So we have many different definitions and I'm, I'm sure that most of you joining also have your own understanding and definition. So the very, what we call the very short definition, the super simple, it's almost too simplistic, but the short definition is, number one, a cluster needs to be a formal program. So there has to be a program behind it, either at the national level or the regional level or the local level. Uh, simply saying we have an ecosystem and we would like that ecosystem to magically turn into a cluster uh, doesn't meet the requirement of, of point number one. Point number two, um, a cluster in our definition has to be a legal organization with employees and brand. Now we know many clusters are project organizations or they're just technically projects within, for example, a business school or for example, a technical university. And again, uh, we question if that is, that is the best setup. Uh, we do need to see formal employees and we do need to see a brand um, and a narrative behind that sort of legal organization. And, and then finally, number three, and this I think is, is maybe the most important, um, all the successful clusters that we've ever looked at have always been a public-private partnership and also a public-private funding model. So we're not gonna find any public only or private only programs. And, and some of the government representatives I've been working with, for example, they have basically, they've been wanting to design a program and then just implement it down, well, what I call from the government offices, which of course is not gonna be very successful. So as we get into clusters, some of you may, may be very experienced, some of you may be very new, we, we have these sort of three definition and three requirements, formal program, legal organization, and public-private partnership. One of the things that we have in the program is serving different level of experiences. And we developed the cluster starting point canvas to basically make sure that, that you start at your right level and then you develop. And we have designed the online program to actually serve all of these different groups 
which means if you, let me switch into, if you have a very low previous experience with cluster programs, you would probably be at the starting point. So in this case, you may want to be joining the program and saying, you know, I don't know what a cluster is. I have no previous experience. Uh, I may be working at, let's say, the Ministry of Finance or Ministry of Trade, and we are looking into potentially, maybe in the future, uh, build a cluster program. But right now, we have pretty much no idea what we're doing. And that's fine. This program is perfectly suitable at that level. Although we do expect that the majority of participants will probably be here. So their, their starting point is we want to grow. We have some basic experience. So we have a basic level of experience and we have some sort of proven economic impact from the cluster. Now we want to develop this. We want to expand it. Maybe we want to uh, move from emerging clusters to growth clusters. Maybe we want to move from, uh, from a sort of a low impact to a high impact. Um, but participants in that category will find a lot of very valuable content. Then we have the upgrade category. And these are really powerful clusters that have significant experience. And they also have really strong economic impact. So, so they are uh, widely known. There are policies in place. There are people in place and funding programs in place. But still, we want to we wanna develop this further. So we do expect a, a number of people to actually be in this upgrade and say, I want to take my cluster or I want to take my national cluster program from this level to the next level. Then we have down here, we have a little bit different category. And this is something that we found researching some of the slightly older clusters, because across Europe particularly, um, we find a number of clusters that have been operating for quite some time. So they've been in, in, in operations for many years, but they don't have that much to show for. So the economic impact hasn't really been what we expected. So those programs, uh, including some that, that we've worked on uh, personally over the last couple of years, is really we need to reinvent the program. From top to bottom, we need to reinvent, we need to rethink, we need to reskill, we need to retrain, and we need to completely reconfigure what our cluster program looks like. Some of those clusters may be closely linked to, to universities. They may be uh, operated by, by academic staff that wouldn't necessarily be the, the right sort of leadership uh, people for, for a cluster. They may have very limited funding. They may have a very poorly developed business model and they may have a, a reliance on, for example, um, too many government representatives and too little industry representatives. So for some reasons, they need a massive reinvention. And then finally, we have, an, uh, as we will show you in the program, we found a number of really powerful clusters. I mentioned Cap Digital in, in France. We have some of the uh, super clusters in Canada. We have some of the clean tech uh, clusters in, in Spain and Europe. So we found a, a number of very, very, very capable clusters. And you'll meet many of them in the program. And, and in their case, they really just want to sort of push to the next level and develop even further, especially around how to attract investors and risk capital and how to secure more startups and scale-ups. Most of you will probably find yourself somewhere on this map. You may be in that starting point, like we have no experience, but we're interested. Some of you may be on that reinvent, and some of you may be on the upgrade and develop. We have designed the program to be flexible enough. So wherever you're starting from, you will be perfectly capable to go through and complete the program based on uh, which exercises you choose to do and based on which project you choose to focus on. And I think the flexibility here is a key word for all of the participants going through the program. So we have this, and you can read more about this in the slide. But I think this starting point has been very important as we have been able to talk to people and, and, and really understand the majority of clusters today are somewhere in this category. And a good number is here, and then a handful are here. And we would just like this program to be equally relevant to everyone. 
So why do we need this program? Now, one of the big things, and, and you echo that with pretty much 90 some percent of, of, the, of the votes in the poll, is we know for a fact that the world of innovation clusters, it is changing and changing very rapidly. Now, we have been writing about this 2017, Malaysia, 2018, Switzerland, 2019, the, the Building Innovation Supercluster Report, both in English and, and Mandarin Chinese. Uh, but we've seen a very clear trend uh, in the research we've done, in the work we've done, and in all of the interviews and conversations that we've had. For example, we know for a fact that, that superclusters are on the rise globally. Just as an example, Denmark last year, they used to have 42 local clusters. Now they're converging them and they're gonna end up with roughly 10. And some of those 10 are really fighting for top global positions, effectively what, what, what we would call a Danish supercluster initiative. Second, we're facing a massive paradigm shift. And I don't know how familiar you are with, with Thomas Kuhn, but paradigm shifts are brutal changes to how people think and how people lead the clusters today. And we're gonna come into that in, in, in just a few minutes. And then finally, we realized, and this is, this is absolutely critical, and I, I can't emphasize this enough. We're seeing huge differences in terms of the role government play. Now we have some countries where we don't find a national program, but we find a, a you know, semi-functioning local or regional program. Uh, but then we compare that to sort of the best practices where the government have really put their heads together and they've really done what I would call a crazy impressive job of developing the national frameworks. So, so these are some of the trends that we're seeing that we talk about in the program. And we're also reaching out to a number of experts. So here we have Bianca Dragomir. So Bianca is um, um, a CEO for one of the Spanish clean tech clusters, but she's also been a very, very active thought leader and speaker on uh, the need for new cluster thinking in Europe. Uh, she is the, um, she's the um, originator of the Clusters of Change initiative that we talk quite extensively about. Um, we also look extensively at why countries need to think about economic diversification. Now, of course, I guess most of you follow the oil and gas situation, as well as some of the implications and the, the fallouts of COVID-19. And it's, it's clear that countries need to think much more proactively about economic diversification. And this is equally valid for uh, manufacturing countries in Europe, for energy-based countries in the Middle East, for a growing number of countries in, in Asia. Uh, and we do cover in the program uh, quite a bit on, on how to think about the, the national perspective and how to think about the national program in light of a economic diversification. We also talk extensively about this shift from triple helix to bring in the risk capital and the entrepreneurs and the shift to the Pentagon framework. Now, what's been extremely interesting in the interviews that we have been doing is that most clusters have this as the official structure. So they would often use a language. They will talk about triple helix. They will say, you know, we have this many uh, academic members, we have this many industry members, and we have some government members. But when you really start digging into them, you really start sort of, uh, you know, shining uh, a light in, in different places, you realize, you know, most clusters, they have uh, entrepreneurs, and the majority have some sort of relationship, although a very, very weak one, to the, the risk capital and, and the private um, funding landscape. But they just haven't connected the dots. So one of the big changes why we need this program is actually to help clusters connect all of these in a much more holistic way than what we've seen in the past. That's something we cover extensively in the program. <clears throat> so I want to share with you three cases uh, because we've built a number of case studies in the program. And some of those case studies come with interviews. Some of those case studies come with uh, just the strategy documents, and some of those case studies come with sort of an in-depth analysis. One of the case studies that really impressed me is from France. I mentioned it briefly, and it's Cap Digital. And Cap Digital is probably the closest we have at the moment to an innovation supercluster in Europe. They have 40 employees, more than a thousand members. They have helped their companies raise hundreds of millions of, of funding over the years. 
and they've been in operation for about 15 years. We have an extensive case study where you as participants get a chance to, to meet the, 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 the general manager, Patrick, you get a chance to read some of the strategy document and we really go into you know, how is this cluster different? Because it is, it is almost unheard of to have a cluster with, with 40 staff members, with the majority of European clusters, they have pretty much one and a half employees. So one of the things that you'll take away is actually you can start cracking the business model and cracking the strategy behind Cap Digital. Equally, we, uh, we look at some Norwegian cases. Here is a quick case on the finance innovation cluster as one of the uh, FinTech clusters that we have in the Nordics. And we have a board and we start mapping out what is the organizational structure behind the cluster. And, and I know for some of you, this is something that is quite obvious because you've done this a million times. And of course, you know how to build your organization structure for a cluster. But also we find that a large number of people, they, they don't have perhaps a clear enough understanding of how a cluster organizational structure is similar or different from a regular organization. So of course, we, we go into mapping out in the case study, we look at the board, we look at the CEO, we look at the uh, staff that they have, and we look at how the structure supports the strategy and strategy follows structure. And we look at how these, the full-time employees also interact with these so-called innovation groups. So in different ways, we kind of, uh, we, we, we deconstruct clusters to help you understand better. But much more importantly is then continuously asking, so what does your cluster structure look like? And then you get a chance, if you're so inclined, to complete this in the exercises. So here, for example, we would ask you, can you just quickly fill out who are your board members? Who's the CEO? What does your team look like? And then you would basically start filling out the potential roles that you have. And then secondary, you would look at your innovation groups or what some call the project groups or the working groups, and you would start mapping this out. And what we've seen is that when you map this out really, really like fully to the detail and you start connecting the dots, most people that we've worked with, most clusters we've worked with realize that there's a lot of things that they can improve simply at the organizational level. For example, do you have a clear ownership of who owns the innovation groups? Have you connected, let's say, this board member into this group and this board member into this group? So did you get the organization to work optimally? Now, well, of course, we, we look to Canada. Um, and one thing that's really unique about, about the Canadian Ocean Supercluster, where we dig into the background, we dig, in, dig into the strategy documents, we have a conversation with the CEO, Kendra. Um, they've been really good at strategic communication. They have the strategic plan, they have the annual report, they have some of the new uh, projects that are coming up. And I think a lot of clusters can actually learn from that strategic communication that Canada has. So when we dig into to these in the program, you can also then jump into the exercises and all the exercises are op optional. And, and you can um, download the documents, you can go through the questions, and you can really build your own learning and understanding of what is the Canadian ocean supercluster look like and what can I take away? What can I take away from, from that um, experience? So these are, again, just some examples of the case studies and some example of the exercises that we put, put together. Now, one question that we've been getting is, of course, who is this program for? And the way that we see it, kind of going back to what we talked about in the introduction, uh, we have six kind of distinct participant profile. So the first profile that we see, and, and this is really the, the majority, is the cluster CEO, the cluster manager. So this program is, is targeted very specifically at the cluster CEO, the cluster manager. But at the same time, every single cluster CEO that we've ever, ever spoken to, they're too busy for pretty much anything. So a large part of that program is actually aimed at the team around the CEO, where we encourage maybe one or two cluster employees to actually take the program, and then maybe they loop back, and then they can connect and collaborate on it later. We also have a number of elements more at the national level. So we want to work specifically with the national cluster program or the regional cluster program. And we do assume that they have more of an expert role. So they will be able to get into some of the more advanced material. We also have a good part of the program for policymakers, 
we do cover enough basic foundation for people that are new to clusters. And we also cover enough sort of supporting material for consultants and business school faculty and others that may be interested, but they wouldn't necessarily be working very closely with clusters on a daily basis. But the key word here is, is flexibility. We've designed this to be very flexible and you will get a lot of value out of it as a cluster team, but you will also get a lot of value at if you're just starting out and you want to learn more about clusters. <clears throat> One thing that's been a lot of fun in, in this program has been cracking what we call the program design. I'm going to walk you through this a little bit of detail. So the program design that we've chosen is complete flexibility. That means that you can complete this entire program in one day if you so prefer. Or you can stretch it out over a few weeks, or you can stretch it out over a few months. That is completely up to you. And you can choose the elements that you want to work on, and I'll walk you through that step by step. So a big part of the program is this e-learning platform, where you have a total of five modules, pre-phased introduction, landscape, strategy, leadership, and clusters in action. And you can, you can go through all of that in, in one day or even one evening if you, if you still prefer. And what we have next is the optional digital workshop. And this is for people that would like to connect to the larger community and actually work together in a digital format. Not a webinar like we have here, but more of an interactive online session. And we're gonna run that every single month for the next 12 months. I really try to build an active living community of participants. We also have a number of guests that we mentioned. So we have people from Spain, from France, from, from Canada, from Norway, Denmark, and, and beyond that, that come in and actually contribute with, with great interviews and case studies. But maybe the most important thing is down here. So this is connecting this program back into your cluster reality by doing the project work. I'll talk a little bit more about the details, but effectively we have designed a program that allows you to work on some of the clusters top challenges step by step by step as a part of this program. And you'll end up here with what we call a clusters of change roadmap or cluster strategy roadmap. That is basically a 10 year development plan for your cluster. That's what you're ending up with in the last project. And then we also have, and these are optional, uh, we have a number of different exercises. I showed you one with the um, Canadian Ocean Supercluster. So you can choose to complete all or any of maybe even none of these exercises if you so prefer. That's completely up to you. So again, flexible. You can go through everything in one day. You can stretch it out over a couple of weeks or you can stretch it out over a couple of months. Completely up to you. One of the big things um, that we've been hearing is the value of, of getting these cluster strategy tools. So we have selected 15 plus strategy tools that you get access to in various shapes and forms. So we have a complete toolkit available and effectively you can just send it to print and then you get the whole thing. It is not... It's not as thick, but it's, it's close. So you have the tools and then you have the basic instructions. And of course, you, if you want to have more instructions, you can just jump online. And in the program, we go through a lot of these in quite extensive detail. Here, for example, we have an online case study in the uh, collaboration platform called Miro that we walk through step by step in a 22 minute case where we look at what would a national cluster framework look like. So in the program, this takes 22 minutes and we walk step by step by step by connecting the national economic context, by connecting the national cluster program and then connecting the local or individual cluster designs. So this is just one example. And, and, and we really encourage you where it makes sense to pick up these exercises and actually complete them yourself. 
Uh, and as you see here, you can do this completely online. Or if you so prefer, you can, you can do it on, on paper or PowerPoint or PDF or any other format. Now, for some of you, this building a national cluster framework would be very relevant. And, and for some of you, maybe it wouldn't be relevant at all. So we have very different exercises and very different questions that we do introduce you to. Uh, one of the questions we have is around your cluster strategy. We're gonna spend a little bit of time on, on this. So as we've been showing you, we do have a number of case studies, but we also show you some hypothetical clusters. So what would potentially, what would potentially a Brazilian solar energy cluster look like? So we have a large number of examples that are based not on facts, but on suggestions. And, and I hope, hopefully, that this can, can inspire people, you know, potentially in Brazil, to actually really think and rethink what could we actually be doing in terms of, of growing the Brazilian solar energy economy. Now, as you see here, we're using the, um, the same app, Mira. We have the ambition. So in this case, a Brazilian solar energy um, cluster. The ambition would be to grow it by 50% annually for the next 10 years, which of course aggregates up to some pretty steep numbers. But I think at the same time, that's completely realistic when you look at the global market growth. But the question is, well, how would we do that? And this is where we start digging into some of the more, 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 more advanced stuff. So we would say, well, the first thing as an example would be market access international. So the cluster would actually need to, to work extensively on international market access, opening markets in Africa, year number one, opening markets in Asia, year number three, and then opening eventually markets in Latin by year number five. Equally, we would suggest looking at in-country market development. And here you can see how would we do it. We'd build an innovation group, build a national policy framework, and then with the help of government, provide access to cheap credit or cheap loan that would enable the rollout of, of the, the um, in-market development in Brazil. We would look at education and knowledge. We would look at research and development, and we would look at access to, to capital all the way from seed to utility scale uh, investment parks. <clears throat> we have a lot of these different um, examples. And those of you joining this webinar with extensive experience, you would look at this and say, yeah, this is pretty easy. This is what we do on a regular basis. Uh, but we do hope that some of these pretty introduction level uh, examples can be very useful to people that also have maybe a little bit less uh, or maybe no uh, previous experience with, with clusters. We also introduce uh, some of the more, uh, I'm going to say groundbreaking ideas around clusters. Uh, and something I've been working extensively for the last couple of years is what should the cluster do in regard to investor capital? Now, some clusters coming from a research paradigm, coming from the traditional triple helix paradigm, they would say, you know, why should we care about investor capital? Why is that even relevant to us? Um, and that may have been a fair question five years ago. Today it is um, borderline and irresponsible. Every single cluster uh, manager I've been speaking with in this program will absolutely in some regard say that we have not only, a, not only an opportunity, but actually a responsibility in providing investors, providing investor capital and providing growth capital to our various members. So then the question is, well, how would we do it? Now, again, in the program, we introduce you to the, the supercluster capital strategy map. And this map helps you understand, well, we could be doing events, we could be doing network, we could be doing business angels, or we could start building our own in-house fund. We need to think in our own country. We need to think in our region, Europe, Asia, Middle East, and the Americas. And the implications of this, of course, is that if you are a clean energy cluster, you can't have local investors from your local community because it's not going to be enough. You actually need as a cluster to build a robust long-term capital strategy on how to attract hundreds of millions, if not billions into your cluster. Talking about paradigm shift. You need to understand how should we, in the case of a clean energy cluster, how should we work with small VC funds from our country, 
from our region, from Europe, from Asia, from the Middle East, and from the Americas. Now, this may seem foreign to some clusters, but in the program, we interview actual investor relation managers in clusters, and they will tell you exactly how to get started on, on doing this in practice. And also, uh, in the program, we introduce you to the software app behind this Rad Tools platform. So you can actually work on this in a completely cloud-based solution. You can work on it uh, alone, um, or you can work with them uh, in the cloud. So you can do, uh, you can develop this cluster capital strategy using PDF, using PowerPoint, using paper, using Miro, or using the Strategy Tools platform. Adding investors and building that investor base over time. Now, maybe the most important part before we get into the Q&A here is, is back to your project work. And the project work has, has three sort of main pieces, main pieces. The first is what we call the cluster snapshot. And the cluster snapshot is one page cluster outline your name, manager, time in the role, the team you have, the board you have, the business model you have, your current member base, current strategy, long-term challenges, and short-term needs. Uh, and this, we have seen, is a really powerful way of aligning your cluster and aligning your cluster team, and maybe also aligning your cluster board. And you take that with you as you start the program. Second, you work on the strategy intro, where you actually say, looking forward, what is our ambition? What's our focus areas? Maximum five, and then what are the targets of the next five years? But finally, and this is, the, this is the big project, and we introduced this in a lot more detail in the program. This is the Clusters of Change roadmap. This was developed in collaboration with Bianca Dragomir, uh, coming out of the Clusters of Change um, work um, last year. This is your main project. Uh, this is a 10-year development plan. What is your cluster going to look like over the next 10 years? Now, we have used this with, um, with a number of different clusters. It is a advanced, complex, and long-term project work. To complete this, yes, you can, you can do it uh, by yourself over a good glass of wine. But you probably want to work with your team. You probably want to work with your board. You probably want to work with your members and partners. Ideally, you would have hundreds of people from your cluster contribute into this. And of course, we show you how this can be done online. In the cluster of change roadmap, you start by what is your current status? Strengths and weaknesses, current funding model. So just basically picking information from the snapshot. And then you look at the short term, the medium term, and the longer term. So again, we have one, three, and five year horizon. And then we get all the way up to a 10 year horizon. Notice this. This is what we call the business model evolution or cluster business model evolution. In the last module, we extensively dig into how to think about and how to work on business model innovation for clusters. And we introduce a number of new tools, a number of, number of new concepts, and a handful of, of examples and case studies of how can you work on your business model from a cluster point of view. So as you're working through this, I think that you'll find a lot of um, difficult questions, but hopefully they will trigger more strategic thinking and more strategic development for your cluster. Now, it's very important for us that you can actually go through and you can complete this completely alone. I mean, you can, you can go through the entire program in a day, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, completely by yourself or together with your team. And we're seeing now a growing number of, of clusters kind of reaching out and want to do it with a team or at least a group of different cluster managers. So my... Um, Encouragement is, is really to take a look, sign up today and join us. Um, I think that based on the feedback we've been getting, uh, that we've been able to find a program and develop a program that really covers a, a large range of topics, but splitting it up into manageable chunks and then providing tools and frameworks and software solutions and collaboration solutions that make that um, easily available for people. 
And that really goes for people that have extensive experience and it goes for people that are just getting started. So to close out, there are three things that's really important. Number one, we're really trying to build better innovation clusters. And we have interviews and research and insights that really points to best practices. And we're trying to share those. Second, we know that the majority of clusters are going through a cluster paradigm change. Shifting from a triple helix structure to a more of an entrepreneurial, more of a Pentagon uh, framework. And very few clusters actually know how to, to get that done. And then finally, we're seeing a growing number of governments and government representatives, national level, regional level, local level, that are really looking at how should we design or maybe redesign our cluster frameworks to support the clusters that we have and to support the future clusters that we want to develop. And all of those things are covered in the program. So this has been a couple of years in the making. Um, it was really accelerated by the extreme unfortunate events of, of COVID-19. Um, but I hope now with, um, with 37 countries and counting that this is gonna be interesting. I hope it's gonna be valuable. And now I'll be happy to take any Q and A's. I'll be happy to take any comments and then uh, we'll open for, for discussion. Because we have the first question from, from Sweden. So certification is mentioned, what kind of certification? What about relation to ESCA, benchmarking, certification, bronze, silver, and gold? Yeah. So of course we're, we're familiar. With, with all of those benchmarking and certification programs. Um, and well, we have some, some views on that. We're not gonna share that in, in a webinar, but what we decided to do is basically just um, to move ahead without necessarily linking back to those um, uh, existing benchmarks and certification. Um, of course, a bronze cluster will be very close to what we would call an emerging cluster. Gold clusters, on the other hand, are much more developed, much more uh, certified. But I think that there's space for a much more dynamic, there's, much, there's space for a much more entrepreneurial spirit in clusters. So I encourage all clusters to look into the official cluster certification programs, uh, but it's not something that we touch on directly in, in this program. And one, one question I have, and I welcome anyone to, to answer, um, <clears throat> is those of you that are joining that don't have any experience with clusters, um, I'm curious to hear what you would, what would you like to get out of it? So if you don't have experience and you don't have access to clusters today, what would you like to, to get out of it? Um, now, one question we have, what if I can't start the program at this time? Is there a self-paced option? So yes, so the entire program is 100% self-paced. So you can start whenever you like and you finish whenever you like, and you can go back and revisit whenever you like. Uh, the only date you need to care about is if you would like to join the monthly digital workshops. So those are hosted once every month. And I think it's on July 1st, July and July 2nd, uh, and then going every, every month forward. And you can join one of those, you can join uh, every two of them, or you can join every one of them. So you can choose how much you wanna, you wanna join those uh, live digital sessions. But the majority of the program is complete self-paced. Now here we have an interesting comment. So we can help you find clusters in Southeast Asia and beyond Europe in general. We have strong relationship with six global water technology hubs. Wonderful. Yeah, no, I'll, um, so I'll, I'll look into that link uh, afterwards. Thank you very much. And we are, I mean, we're familiar, of course, with Chinese clusters and, and a lot of the work that's happening in, in Asia. But it's just in terms of what we've had time to do so far, we haven't seen enough of the Asian um, landscape yet. That's something that's definitely on, on the radar. But I do encourage everyone, of course, to pay attention to what's happening with Chinese clusters. It's very impressive. <clears throat> Let's see. Mm -hmm. I can actually do this. So we have a question here from um, um, 
Let's see, which in your opinion is the best way to help companies increase their turnover, to accompany them to growth? So from a cluster point of view, uh, here I would say, um, really look at developing specific growth programs for clusters. So you may want to have, um, I mean, of course, you have some startups, you have some scale-ups, you have some SMBs, you have some large international corporates. So you really want to develop specific growth programs. Now, one of the best practices that we have seen in our work is uh, global growth or going global or going export. So these international market development programs have proven to be very, very valuable both in terms of the, the time and, and the resource commitment. So the cluster can set up uh, incubator programs, accelerator programs, which cover uh, early stage companies. But for the slightly later stage companies, they probably want to look at some international growth and international uh, market development programs. Um, then we have a question, what is the price for a course? So, so the price for the course for one participant full price is, is $4.99. Uh, and then there's team discounts for, for five, and then there's team discount for, for 10 people, up to 60% for, for teams of, of 10 people and more. Um, are the bilateral consultations with you, Chris, possible during the, the course? So, so Marta, um, there are two ways of, of doing that. So one is um, you can join the monthly live sessions. And then hopefully we can discuss quite openly with anyone that is on those, those digital workshops. Uh, if you would like to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, just you, know, you can reach out anytime and I'd be happy to help um, for a quick conversation or anything else. So here we have another question on, to what extent can the program slash toolkit help to create clusters focused on non-economic objectives for example, change initiatives at local level. So good, good question. So this would really go back to what is the ambition and what are the focus area for the cluster? Uh, for example, uh, focus area could be talent development. Uh, and we've seen some clusters that say um, more than purely economic development, we need to build you know, the, the workforce of tomorrow. So the cluster actually has a massive reskilling or retraining or training and education uh, responsibility. So in, in that case, you would say that one example of a non-economic objective would be uh, build out workforce capabilities, which would be perfectly suited to, to many, many clusters. Now, you can also think about other examples, but this is what we would call uh, completely within a cluster scope, and it would just be a natural part of the strategy development for that cluster. So I, I hope that answered the, the question. I'll be happy to do a follow-up on, on that if that's um, interesting. Here's a different one. This is interesting. <clears throat> and this we're going to have to discuss. With the situation at the moment, some of the cluster team are on furlough. What would be your advice to come out of the situation successfully? So the first thing, when we did interviews we realized that the best clusters, they said COVID-19 is a challenge. We need to charge through it. We need to lead. We need to lead by example, and we need to come up with solutions and programs for our members. So we need to work twice as much as we normally would because taking a break is just not an option. And I remember when I was speaking to, um, to Kendra, the CEO of the Ocean Supercluster in Canada. I mean, she was just extremely passionate on the important role the cluster have in, in guiding the Canadian companies and the Canadian members through this crisis. So the first thing I would say that if any clusters have people on, on furlough, people on leave, people on you know, reduced work, they need to get back to work. And they need to get back to work fast. Once they're back at work, uh, they can skip weekends and, and start putting in uh, five, six, seven um, days a week for a couple of weeks because they need to come up with what should the cluster do to help our members through COVID-19. And um, in terms of the specific actionables, we have seen so many good programs. We've seen webinars. We've seen large strategic initiatives of, of what the clusters can, can do uh, to help their companies uh, 
uh, right now. So I don't know if, if that helped answer the question, but, but my take is that clusters have a massively important role to play and they need to get back to work. We have a question from, uh, from Mattia. Um, I'm doing the course and it's in the first interaction with cluster. What would be the best way to start it? Is there a possibility to join a cluster of interest, energy, ocean, plastic, healthcare, many things? Um, so if, if you're just joining, um, now, Mattia, could I just ask you, where are you based? Where, where are you located? Um, you know, which country or which city? Um, because globally, there's around 7,000 clusters. Europe has just below 3,000 clusters. You look at a country like Denmark, they used to have 42, now they have 10. Uh, you look at a country like Germany, I mean, they have, they have dozens of clusters. So there's a very large chance, Mattia, that you're gonna find a cluster somewhere in your local um, area. Reach out, say hello, tell them you'd like to join. Um, most likely they'll be very happy to welcome you. Or you can go online. You can go online and basically find a cluster in your country or even in your part of the world and just reach out and say, I'd like to join. Or even better, tell them that you'd like to join and do some work with them and, and say that you're open to, to somehow contributing or collaborating with them and just see what, what they say. One of my big things for clusters is they should look at um, interns. They should look at... Uh, free consultants, they should look at people that are sort of in between jobs and see if they can come in and do a, a job to contribute to the cluster. That may be you. <clears throat> um, we also have a few questions in the chat area. So who are the other experts you want to involve in the program? So we have, um, so Uli, we, we already have a, a number of other experts that we have involved. So we have done extensive interview with with innovation managers, with um, uh, cluster CEO, with investor relations, um, and so on. So you'll find those in the program. And then we have a question from Muhammad. Will this program help us initiate a structured discussion with government program or incubators to build clusters open innovation? So Muhammad, absolutely, absolutely, yes. Uh, so particularly the first two parts to module, what we call module one and two, uh, will very, very um, specifically help you initiate these conversations. So that's, um, that's something that, that we would um, positively confirm. Um, second question from Uli here. Uh, do you have insights on the set of skills cluster managers should bring along? So I'm not sure what you mean expects about, about bringing along, but one thing that we do, uh, we look specifically at leadership. Uh, and I have, I have quite some experience with leadership education, leadership development, uh, both from a teaching point of view, business school, and also from, from actual development. <clears throat> so one of the things that we introduce is the eight levels of cluster leadership. And there's both a background, there's a little bit of research, uh, but there's also a self-assessment and then a self-development program where we encourage you to actually work on your own cluster leadership skills uh, over time using the materials that you'll find in the program. So, so all of that is, is covered right there. So my friends, we are almost at, at time. Um, I hope you found this valuable. Um, we are extremely passionate about the need for better cluster uh, leadership, uh, both at the strategic level and the operational level. And I hope that this program can be a contribution. So if you're interested, um, sign up. If you have any more questions that I didn't get a chance to answer, you can just reach out to me or anyone from, from my team and we'd be happy to, to speak more with you. And um, if you have any, any further questions or comments as you go through the program, you can reach me anytime. And then for those of you joining, I will see you in the first live digital workshop at just the beginning of July. Thank you very much and have a wonderful evening, have a wonderful afternoon and have a wonderful day, everyone. All the best. <laughs>